Thank you. Have a good practice. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thomas. Um, thank you to Inside LA for everyone who is putting this together and Juan. Um, for Martin, for hosting me, everyone. Thank you all for coming out and supporting um, everything. So it's been really uh, wonderful uh, to be here <clears throat> and especially really nice to be here with you all tonight to share this space. Um, yeah, you know, that weekend, that week, that was the, the Charleston massacre that week, yes. remember? And so the weekend was actually like, we had like a memorial. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a lot of people coming in grieving and needing space. And so part of that last dialogue, if you read the book, it was about, you know, holding space, you know, and, and looking into that, um, um, and doing the, the mourning, you know, for us. So there's always going to be mourning. You know, it's always going to be the work of grieving. Um, if we occupy a human body and live within the relative, you know, within this realm, you know, there'll always be suffering. You know, there's always going to be pain, you know, but what we're uh, gifted with, with this practice, with this tradition and lineage is tools, methods to, to really engage the discomfort, the pain, the trauma. You know, and this is why I came into practice was because I was <clears throat> very much out of control. You know, I know that's hard for you to believe, but I was just really uh, angry. I was sad. I was scared. Um, I was al also moving through, you know, severe depression um, at the time. And... I wasn't looking for Buddhism. I wasn't looking to meditate, you know. I was looking for it to, you know, I, I was looking for an alleviation of suffering. I didn't know what that alleviation was going to look like. Um, but the past, you know, for some of us has a tendency to kind of open up and put us in places where we thought we would never be, you know. Like some of us in this space um, never thought that we would ever... <laughs> be meditating, you know, and coming to something like this, you know, nor does our family really get it, you know, they're like, what are you doing with this thing, you know, we don't, you know, we're not into Buddhism, that's not what we do, you know, um, at least my family was like that, they're like, you know, I would, I got into practice and started meditating, and that became a method for me to work with what I was experiencing, and then I would start going to, like, retreats, and stuff, you know, <clears throat> and of course, on my voicemail, I would be like, oh, I'm away, you know, right, and my mom, uh, she would call me and leave a message, you know, and, she, and I would call her back after the re these retreats, and, I would, and she would be like, where were you? It's like, oh, I'm on like a prayer retreat, because <laughs> <laughs> my mother is a minister, you know, she's a, she's a minister, and so I would say, oh, yeah, I went away for this, like, prayer meditation retreat. Yeah, I left out Buddhism. Um, I kept leaving out Buddhism until I decided to go into a three-year retreat, and then I was like, oh, I'm Buddhist, <laughs> and I'll see you in three years, um, and that, for my mom, you know, it actually went really well. You know, I told her exactly, you think I'm exaggerating. That's exactly what I told her. I was like, listen, I'm a Buddhist. I've been meditating. I'm going to do this retreat. I've already decided, so I'll see you. But I gave her a year's notice, right? You know, she's the only one who took it well <laughs> in my family, strangely enough. You know, but, you know, you get to this point where, I think we talked about this last night, you begin to understand what is required for your liberation, you know, what is required for you to move out of a place of this deep suffering, this, this deep pain. And your liberation and the choices you're making around your liberation may look very different than everyone else's choices. You know? And this is why I love spiritual paths, you know, particularly paths about really authentic liberation, because it's all going to look very different. And because all of our path looks very different, I'm actually celebrating learning from what other people are doing. You know? I mean, there's so many kinds of people in the world. There's so many kinds of people gathered in this space tonight. 
you know, and we all require a different medicine, you know, to treat the illness, you know, and the illness, illness for us with, um, you know, on this path is the illness of delusion, the illness of ignorance, the illness, the illness of um, aversion and craving, you know, and we all need different medicines to work with that. And my medicine was three years of retreat. <laughs> You know, it was like the emergency room, you know, it's like, let's get out of here quick as hell, you know, but it's different for everyone. So tonight, you know, we're going to be looking at self-preservation, resiliency, which is something that I love talking about. It's something that I love to do. Um, I really started thinking about this this weekend, that weekend of Radical Dharma in 2015. Mm -hmm. the summer of 2015, you know, where after, you know, this, the massacre in Charleston, you know, Yasmin and I went out and got our nails done, you know, and, you know, and, you know, people, you know, people are like, really, you know, and I, and I say, you know, we all need to figure out, you know, what our um, rituals of self-care look like, you know. And when I say self-care, I mean self-care in the, the work and tradition of Audre Lloyd, you know, who spoke about self-care as uh, not being self-indulgent, but as an act of self-preservation. Self-preservation um, is political warfare. You know? And so self-care as indulgence, it looks like isolation. It looks like pulling away from community. It looks like you know, not wanting to return back into the work of getting free, both individually and collectively. You know, that's self-care as self-indulgence. You know, but self-care as self-preservation means I need to figure out when I've hit my edge and I've gone over my limits, and I need to figure out how to refrain and to do something to restore myself, you know, so I can enter back into meaningful work, enter back into liberation work, enter back into collective engagement with the community and so forth. You know, um, this is the work that so many of us are at a loss to understand. You know, um, some of some of us feel as if we have no agency, no right to take care of ourselves, that our needs are um, secondary to everyone else's needs. You know, the needs of our kids, the needs of our families, the needs of our partners, the needs of work, you know, what have you. You know, and at some point, the path of self-preservation means that I have to start understanding that my needs matter. Because if my needs are not being fulfilled, then I, well, for me, when my needs aren't being fulfilled, I enter into spaces and places of violence. You know, because I am operating from a place of lack, you know, and poverty. You know, this poverty mind is this very, you know, you're functioning on empty, you know. And for me, at least, and it may be different for you, but for me, when I'm on empty, I get really, I lose the ability to empathize. You know, my own fear, my own resentment come up as blocks that keeps me from really benefiting others, you know. And I get so resentful, and I say, you know, God, I've taken care of everyone, but who's taking care of me? You know, and that was my narrative for uh, many years. It's like, who's going to take care of me, you know? You know, as, <clears throat> you know, in this position, like, I'm you know, like a <clears throat> a Buddhist teacher, you know, whatever. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know if I'm actually talking about Buddhism. But, you know, but, you know, people come to me, they're like, I need help. I need you to save my life. You know, I, I do get those requests. People kind of lose it and they're like, surely you can cure me. <clears throat> <laughs> you know, and I'm like, nah, I probably can't. But, you know, what I can do is actually reflect back to you some of the work that you need to do and then help you maybe find other methods, other modalities, you know, that can be of help, 
you know, for you. But that takes a lot of emotional processing, a lot of energy, a lot of doing. And it's not like that's billable work, you know. It's not like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to charge you, you know, like whatever, an hour. You know, it doesn't, it's not like that. The work of liberation isn't something that we can, like, you know, build out. It's just the work that comes from being in the world and wanting people to be safe and happy and what we're called to do in any moment to work towards people's happiness and safety. You know, but you get to a point where you keep giving and giving and giving and you forget to give to yourself. You know, like you forget to to drink as you're pouring. As one of my teachers often tells me all the time. You know, as you feed other people, are you also, you know, feeding yourself? You know, and that's an obstacle for many of us. We actually feel as if we don't have a right to be fed. You know, and we don't have a right to partake of the meal that we're preparing all the time for other people, but somehow it's not, you know, it's not for us. Like I used to, I love to cook. <clears throat> I also love just to eat, but like I just love to cook and, you know, I love to have, you know, gather people together. I don't do it often anymore because I'm always on the road, but sometimes I'll like spend a lot of time cooking for people and then it's time to serve and, you know, gather people and like I realize I haven't been eating, you know, but I put out this whole spread, and I'm like, okay, everyone go and eat, go and get your plate, go and, you know, fix your plate and sit down, and, you know, then you get really resentful, <laughs> like, oh my god, I'm so ungrateful, no one said thank you, like, no one, you know, and it comes from me not being able to kind of, like, feed myself as I'm preparing to feed others, you know, some of us do that, you you know, you get to, you set the table, you invite people to the table, and sometimes you're like, whoa, you know, I'm just going to, like, flutter around and help and, like, make sure everyone else is taken care of. No, you go and sit down as well. You invite yourself to the table in the same way you invite other people to the table. Some of you are brilliant organizers, activists, you cultural workers, you pull people together, you invite people into these really beautiful spaces you know, for this transformation to happen, but sometimes you think that, but it's not for you. This is for other people, you know. And at some point you have to consider that this is also for you. The table that you set is not just for others, but it's also for you, you know. So when I teach, you know, and offer Dharma, like I'm offering it first and foremost to myself. Like, I'm offering something that I need to hear. So basically, you don't even exist. Like, no one's here. <laughs> it's just me. Well, it's just me. It's just Rod sitting here and saying, oh, what do you need to hear tonight? Oh, yeah, you need to be reminded, you know, that you need to to drink as you pour. You need to feed yourself as you feed others, you know. And as I offer this, and maybe this is something that you can also feed yourself with, that you can also partake in as well. You know, so the world is shit. <clears throat> and it's okay to say that. You know, this is samsara. Samsara means cycle of ignorance or, you know, this reality that's based upon ignorance or delusion, you know. So samsara isn't supposed to work out for anyone. Some sorry isn't supposed to be fun, it's not supposed to be utopia, it's supposed to be shit. So some the world is doing what it's supposed to do. You know. But however, what I am called to do, however, is to develop to develop a different relationship to this. You know, to develop a different relationship to what's happening in the world inside of me and then to make a commitment to free as many people from this as possible. You know, because samsara, it may be a mess, but it's a mess that we can escape, that we can leave, we can transcend, you know. But you have to be committed to the development of clarity. But that clarity comes with pain. You know, the truth isn't easy, but the truth is the antithesis to samsara, to ignorance, to delusion, 
wisdom, clarity, openness, vulnerability, directness, all of that is the antithesis to the chaos that we experience. You know? But what are you willing to offer? You know, what are you willing to, to give up? What are you willing to do? You know, in the spirit of Malcolm X, by what means are you willing to get free? You know. And that's what it boils down to, is our effort, our diligence, our belief that we can be free. You know. I only do the things that I do because I know the consequences of not doing them. Like, I know the consequences of the deepening delusion, the deepening hate, the deepening despair. And I get that, you know, and I want a different experience, you know. But to get free, we have to get extreme and radical. You know, and we have to be willing to, to be, to be the person that is weird, to be the person who gets on everyone's nerves. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you know, you have to be willing to embrace that because it's people are actually relying on you. You know, you may not know it, but there are people who are relying on you, looking at you, and saying, "What are they doing?" You know, like what are they doing? They're they're different. Like they're 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 changing somehow. They're getting more gentle. They're getting happier. What are they doing? You know, and people will look at you and say, "You know what? I trust you more than like the Dalai Lama or someone." You know. So you're like a change leader. You know, without really knowing it, but until you engage in these paths. You know, you don't really realize how many people are following your lead. So, I, you know, that's that. <clears throat> I have more to say. I have a prepared statement, um, which is um, something I kind of put together for the you know, my next book that's coming out. Um, but it's just uh, something that I want to kind of visit later but first I wanted us to just do some practice together do some grounding practice to get us into the space and then we'll have a short break um, super short can people bring food in here no okay so we'll have to grab a few snacks out there and then come back you know and leave it out there but so is anyone new to meditation Okay, a couple of people. This just fine, yeah, because it's very basic. For you know, um, you know, when I <clears throat> when we come into meditation, when we come into the practice, we want to be as natural as possible. You know, you just want to invite your physical body into being with you. You know, not forcing the body into being something that is like really not capable of being in. You know. But when I start my practice, I always ask myself, and my body in particular, I ask, okay, how do you want to be right now? You know, how do you want to be? What's the most comfortable place for you to be? You know, and allow the body to settle into something that feels comfortable. You don't have to be tangled up in something, a little posture, you know, who cares, you know. Like, no one cares. So let your body be free now.
I want you to just briefly think about some of the things that you're grateful for right now. It can be things that just happen today, things you're just in general happy and grateful for. But I want you to invite gratitude into your practice tonight. And I want you to notice how guilt gets in the way of your gratitude. You know, the thought that oh, so many people don't have what they need, why should I be grateful? Just looking at those, those thoughts and just saying, okay, there you are. And just letting those thoughts be there. And try to turn your mind back to what you're grateful for. And when we do practices like gratitude before we begin our actual meditation, this can actually really open our minds up. You know, this is like a lubrication. You know, so let that energy actually relax you. Let your mind open, let your body open. Allow yourself to release what you don't need to be holding on to right now. And now shifting your attention to your seat and noticing the weight of your body on the seat. Noticing the contact of your thighs and sit bones, buttocks on the seat, on the cushion. In this moment, I wonder if you can trust the seat to hold you. Because some of us don't trust anything or anyone else. But maybe in this moment, can you trust that you will be held by the seat? And what does that feel like to trust? Now shifting our attention to touch the floor beneath us. The floor under us represents the earth. And the earth is always holding us. No matter who we are, the earth is always under us. Now, as you may know, it may shake a little bit, but it remains under us, even so. But as the earth is holding us, the earth is also loving us.
And I wonder if you can generate a little bit of appreciation, gratitude for the earth. Feeling the energy of this gratitude forming within the heart center. They're feeling it as a warmth that grows and grows. Imagine that this energy of gratitude in the heart center begins to to float down through the body, out of the bottom of the body, and imagine that that energy begins to sink into the earth. Your energy of gratitude touching into the earth. As that energy touches into the earth, imagine that you are blessing the earth under you. You are making the earth sacred. And feeling the gratitude touching the earth, feeling the earth rise to meet and hold you in gratitude for your blessing. As we continue our practice tonight, remembering that the earth is always under you, always supporting you, always loving you. And when you need to, I want you to remember that you can always come back to the earth to ground yourself, to be held by the earth, or to simply be remembered that there is something that loves you. Let the earth do everything it needs to do. And now turning our attention to our breath. Just noticing <clears throat> initially the in-breath and the out-breath. And our breath is life. Our breath is sustaining. But many of us do not like to breathe. So closing your mouth and just breathing in and out of your nose. You can have a very deep breath if you choose to. As we're breathing in and out from the nostrils, we're not just breathing for the hell of it, we're breathing in a way that begins to settle our nervous systems. And we can imagine that we're breathing all the way down through our bodies, imagining that that breath is touching down to the earth. And as we exhale, we breathe out, imagining that our breath is pulling the energy of the earth into our bodies. So breathing deeply in, my breath is touching the earth, breathing out, my breath is pulling 
the energy of earth into my body. You can even let the, your breath begin to love you. As you're ex inhaling oxygen, the oxygen nourishes the body, replenishes the body. As your breath exhales, it carries out all the material your body doesn't need anymore. So inhaling, my body, my breath is loving me. Breathing out, my breath continues to love me. My breath is always taking care of me, just like the earth. You know, as we breathe in, allowing our shoulders to relax, letting go of the tension that we carry in that part of the body. As we breathe in, relaxing our faces, relaxing our jaws. Relaxing our eyes, relaxing our foreheads, as we relax, allowing the earth to catch us, to hold us, to keep us steady.
we're just shifting our attention now to our mind. And initially, just noticing the thoughts, the emotions. So we notice this material in our minds. And we can just notice it, but we don't have to get involved. Sometimes watching your thoughts and emotions can be like watching clouds passing through the sky. So just sitting back, watching the clouds of thoughts and emotions pass by within the sky of our minds. And we can use the earth and our contact with the earth and the breath as anchors. It keeps our attention grounded, which allows us to have the ability to sit back and watch the material pass through our minds.
And now bringing our attention back to the seat. Again, noticing our bodies resting on our seats. Noticing the earth under us. And trusting that the earth can hold us. Let's shake it out a little bit. Do your best Mariah Carey and shake it off. You know, shimmy it off. Sisters, good to see you again. What's your name? Did we introduce each other? Sister Claire. Sister Claire. Oh, that's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. You sit around a report about the teaching last night. I got it back. <laughs> Thank you for coming out again. Yeah. Yeah. That was lovely. You want a quick break? No. <laughs> we'll take a break. I'll, you know, I'll continue, so I'll just kind of go through this, we'll take a short break, and then we'll have, like, discussion. Um, but I wanted to present this, these kind of, like, so I've been, like, talking about self-preservation for for a while now, um, in different talks and different teachings, and I just kind of started putting notes together, um, and I was hoping that this will make it into my next book. Um, called Love and Rage, which is coming out next summer. Um, so all you're obligated to buy several copies. <laughs> you know, um, don't worry, you'll get the information on how to do that later. But um, so I just I just started putting the. This is like very personal. This is like my thing. These are my principles, right? Um, and um, I just kind of you know. I just kind of like to go through them, you know, and just kind of offer inspiration for people. Um, I have, I start with four quotes here. I'm at the beginning. And these are like my guiding self-care, like teachings. Um, none of them are particularly Buddhist. <laughs> um, but some of you have practiced the seven homecomings with me. So as you know that like in the seven homecomings practice, we think about the texts that are sacred to us. You know, they don't have to be scriptures, they don't have to be holy texts, but things that we use in order to feel inspired. You know, that can be from anyone and anything whatsoever. So the first quote is Audre Lloyd, which I've already shared. Caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. You know, some people get really triggered by, the, you know, political warfare. You know, it's, it's not so triggering if you have survived systematic oppression in your life, as um, I would say many of us have in this space. Um, but, you know, it's political warfare because systems of violence and oppression and power are in place to annihilate us to get rid of us. So when we survive, then we frustrate that system. But I want to do more than just survive. I want to um, actually thrive. And in thriving, I really begin 
to create counter systems that can eventually undo these systems of violence that we find ourselves um, every day struggling in. Um, the second quote, which is a quote that I use in uh, um, Radical Dharma, um, Tony Kappenbar from the Salt Eaters. Uh, are you sure, sweetheart, that you want to be well? Just so as you're sure, sweetheart, ready to be healed because wholeness is no trifling matter. A lot of weight when you're well. Um, from the Salt Eaters. Um, and who's who's read the Salt Eaters before? A couple of people try. It's it's dense. <laughs> It's like it's like you think it's gonna be like an easy read, but like Tony Kevin Barr is a very like you know she's a writer, <laughs> you know she loves words and and complex ideas. But you know the Salt Eaters is about a community in the South, um, fictional community that has um, kind of um, is the freed African, the freed slaves. And like the local indigenous community kind of came together and they created this community um, where they practice the seven arts. And the seven arts are like medicine, uh, martial arts, you know, dance and stuff like that, you know. Um, so in this community, healers are revered. Um, they are held alongside actual trained medical doctors. So when someone gets sick, they can get medical treatment, and they also call in the healers from the community. Um, so in the book, there's an activist. It's really, the book is about healing from burnout from activism, really, because the main character is um, being healed by the, the most powerful healer in the community. So she shows up and says, are you ready? You know, I don't want you wasting my time, because when you get well, you have to stay well. You know, and that takes a lot of time. It takes effort. You know, so you just don't get healed and stay there. You know, this is, for me, a part of Dharma practice and meditation. It's like I have to always practice. I have to practice for the rest of my life, no matter how realized I get. You know, like every day I have to practice. Every moment I have to practice. I'm always choosing to be kind instead of petty which is not always a, a, you know, a battle I win. <laughs> As you witnessed last night, you know, it just slips on you. It's like, oh, my God, why am I talking shit about everyone, you know? And then you practice, and you're like, okay, I can do something different. So the next quote, which I've already shared as well, um, is from um, the founder of a lineage um, of yoga that I study in, um, and this is from a teacher named Majala Sati Bhagavati. And she says, we must drink as we pour. You know, so we must drink as we pour. You know, so as I'm pouring for you, as I spoke about earlier, I'm pouring for myself as well. Actually, I get the first pour. <laughs> and then you get the second pour. Because if I don't take care of myself, how am I going to take care of you? You know, there are people in the world trying to, like, work to make other people happy, which is a noble, you know, and brilliant path. But sometimes these people are the most unhappiest people in the world. And what kind of, you know, happiness can you teach if, you're, if it's not coming from a real embodied place of happiness? The real teaching is from how we simply naturally radiate the practice in the spaces around us. You know, it's, you don't, you, you really are not being taught by the words that are coming out of my mouth. <laughs> you know, that's not where your teaching is com coming from. Your, your teaching is actually coming from this kind of energetic presence that you're all, like, tuning into. You know? So feel that. So, you know, just sit and feel what that energetic transfer feels like. You know? Feel it first in yourself. The stability, the groundedness.
So I can't teach anything that I don't live, nor will I ever say anything that is not my experience. You know? So when I talk about this, like drink as you pour and, you know, all this other stuff, like this is what I live. This is groundedness. You know? It's not a magic trick. You know? Though I do charge for it. So the last quote that I use, I actually have a lot of quotes in this that I will go through one by one as well, but these are my opening quotes. So this is James Baldwin. And he says, in America, I was free only in battle, never free to rest. And he or she or they, the one who finds no rest, cannot long survive the battle. You know, so the one who cannot rest does not long survive the battle. And that's sometimes a quote that just kind of hits me over the head. You know, my rest can be an act of political warfare. You know, so you all need to follow the nap ministry on Instagram. <laughs> if you want to see, like, the radical ramifications of rest and the research and the science around resting, follow, um, follow them, her. As, um, on on Instagram, um, and she releases like quotes and studies and research and like just like like these helpful memes that are like go take a nap, <laughs> you know. Um, the rest is so important because it's about sustainability. It's about surviving. You know the things that we're struggling against right now as a community, as a country. These aren't things that are, they're not brand new. You know, it seems brand new. But again, as I talked about last night, this is a, a time of the apocalypse. So apocalypse means unveiling. So what we're doing is just unveiling something that's already been happening forever. You know, the increased you know, racism and misogyny and patriarchy and environmentalism, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, all these things have been going on forever. This is what America, how America was founded, you know. But our work now is to come into accepting what's happening. And when we accept and touch the ground, then we start creating solutions, you know. But this is more than just a battle. This is a long-term war, <laughs> In the same way samsara is a long-term war. That's not just about this life or the years that we have in this life. It's about a span of lifetimes. And this is what Dharma helps us to understand. We are in a span of many lifetimes. You know, I am concerned about what's happened in the past. I'm also concerned about what will happen in the future. But the work that I have to do is in the present. That's where the work happens. The work determines, the work of now determines what will happen in the future. Not maybe, not necessarily for me, but for those coming after me. Um, so the first principle that I'll move into is rituals. You know, so systematic oppression is a ritualized phenomena. You know, it's specific and it's effective. So if we want to create ways of uh, self-preservation within the face of these systems, we also have to get ritualized and specific about the ways in which we restore ourselves and our communities. So it's about ourselves and community, ourselves and collective. I like this quote from RuPaul. Um, he says, the LGBTQ Plus, community has been excluded from many modern rituals. We were denied dating rituals in our teen years. We did not go to, to the prom. So we developed our own rituals out of necessity. You know, for me, what this quote actually reminds me of and helps me to turn my attention to um, is the fact that I have agency to create what I need to create in order to survive and thrive. 
you know, I have the agency, and we have to embrace that agency. So I, you know, I, you know, I hear people, you know, all the time they come to me. Well, I, you know, I kind of practice. I do, I, you know, I may sit and do this, or I may go to a yoga class, or I may take a break, or I may take a nap here and there. And that's not ritualized self-preservation. It's very sporadic. You know, my care has to be as serious as the violence that I'm experiencing on a day-to-day level moving through the world in this body. You know, every day I have to be cycling the energy of trauma and violence through my experience, breathing it out, you know, drinking it out, you know, resting it out, releasing it energetically, any way that we choose to do, but it has to be ritualized, meaning that it has to be regular, it has to be consistent, it has to be every day. Um, And it has to become a habit. You know, just like we have all our bad habits, you know, make self-care like one of those habits that you can't shake. So my next principle, resting, which we've talked about, but um, there's a song by Sweet Honey and the Rock who, you know, if you read Radical Dharma, like, literally half the book is <laughs> Sweet Honey and the Rock, but, like, um, I cannot impress upon you <laughs> how much, how much um, I've been benefited by the music of Sweet Honey and the Rock. So you need to go home and listen to Sweet Honey. Um, and they have this song called Rest for the, Re- for the Weary, and this is a song lyric, which is, There is Rest for the Weary. And that was one of my, you know, particularly when I've gone through really difficult times, is, oh, I always come back to this, there's rest. There's rest for me. You know, that's something that I grew up with in, in, in the church, in the black church in the South. I grew up in the deep South, in the Bible Belt. And this was the kind of theology that we were creating and that my community had created for centuries in order to, to confront systematic racism trauma, a racial trauma, you know, that one day there is rest. But, you know, as some of you know, I want it to rest um, before I die. (laughs) Um, And so that propelled me onto the path of figuring out what this looked like in this body, in this life, what I could do to experience spaciousness, openness, rest, as I am actually moving through the world. Um... And resting, again, you know, resting doesn't mean sleep. You know, some of us sleep, but we don't rest. You know, when I say rest, I mean, how do I let go? How do I actually start laying down the things that I'm clenching onto? How do I rest my mind? You know, in the practice that we just did, how can I offer spaciousness to everything in my mind? That's my rest. I can go to sleep holding on to things and wake up still holding on to it. (laughs) You know, how do I lay that to rest before I actually go into sleeping? Um, So the next principle, love, loving. And this is a quote from the Buddha. Searching all directions with one's awareness, one finds no one dearer than oneself. In the same way, others are dear to themselves. So one should not hurt others if one loves oneself. That's from the Buddha. You know, love is really the heart of the work that I do around self-care, self-preservation. If I don't have the care for myself, then I won't do the things that I need to do in order to restore myself. You know, And sometimes I think love means that I come second. You know, that other people's needs are placed above mine. Um, when in fact, if I, as James Baldwin has already pointed out, if I do not rest, I'm not going to be in this battle for long. You know. It always goes back to the analogy of like being on the plane and the the air masks that fall and the, you know, how you always hear, oh, you have to put the mask on yourself first and then you help someone else. And people are like, no, that's wrong. That's, you know, 
but you can be more effective if you're being cared for in the moment. You know? Because it's not about, oh, let's just go out and help as many people as possible and then run down and die. <laughs> but how can I continue to maintain this vehicle of my body and mind so I can get the maximum benefit out of it for myself and for others around me? You know? We're much more effective when we care for ourselves. Yeah. Um, of course, that leads into compassion. And this is another James Baldwin quote. He says, You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that tormented me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive, who had ever been alive. Again, this is from James Baldwin. Um, these quotes from James Baldwin are particularly from his um, dialogue with um, Nikki Giovanni. It's called, actually, it's called The Dialogue. Um, you can see it on, on uh, YouTube, too. It was a recorded um, dialogue that he and Nikki did. Uh, in the 60s, I think early 70s, um, and it's also a book as well, so you can read it or watch it. But read, watch that exchange between this young radical and Nick Jim when it was young back then. <laughs> you know, this young radical, like re like you know, really like aggressive, like man, what are you talking about? And James Baldwin's the elder, who's like, no, honey, I've been there. <laughs> You know, like, no, this is what we need to do. You ju you're you just starting out. You know, I'm on the other end of something that I've spent my life doing. You know, which is the power of eldership, too, which is another principle. You know, eldership, mentorship. Who are our mentors? Who are, who are our elders? Who's walked the path before us? You know, that's incredibly important. We are losing connection to our elders. We're losing connection to those who've come before us. You know, and they have a wisdom and a knowledge that we need to to take for ourselves. You know, because we also need to be responsible for the young people coming up behind us. You know, if we don't honor our elders now, how are we going to um, step into our eldership when it's time? You know, some of us get there into eldership sooner than others. It's not so much about age. You know, as I think about the gay and queer male community, you know, and the LGBTQ community in general and the AIDS epidemic, how so many people were lost in that. Like, I, I lost a generation of elders, you know. And so some of us get into our 40s and 50s, and all of a sudden, there's a, there's a gap, you know, where are the 70-year-olds? Where are the 80-year-olds? You know, where are the, where are the 60-year-olds? You know, that's what, you know, that there's a detriment when we lose a generation of elders or when, or when we're not connected to our elders. You know, information is lost, and so we have to reinvent the will. <sighs> you know, um, I am excited about becoming an elder. You know, or a daddy, whichever, whichever one of those happens. <laughs> I'm closer to being a, a, anyhow. So compassion. I'm staying on track. I have to stay on track. Um. So, compassion is recognizing my own discomfort first, and my own suffering. You know, touching into that, and then turning my attention outward and saying, you know what, I am not the only person who's uncomfortable, who's struggling. If I don't want to suffer and struggle, maybe other people don't want to suffer and struggle. So how can I get involved in this project to alleviate suffering for everyone, including myself? You know, that's compassion. And compassion is never about closing down. It's not about just, you know, just like being numb. It's actually about living with this full open heart, this full vulnerable heart that kind of breaks open as we talked about last night, that breaking open that keeps me sensitive to the struggle of everyone around me, including myself. You know, so when someone rolls up to me and cusses me out for something, you know, I can say, you know what, you're struggling. 
you know, you're coming from your own pain. You know, you're not just some, like, asshole that kind of rolled up. You know, no, you're like, you're just like me. And you're doing the best that you can. And this is, this act of violence is the best that you know how to do. You know, but we function as both perpetrators and victims as well. So we have definitely been the one who has come out of our own hurt and woundedness and hurt other people. Not intentionally, maybe, but we've hurt and we've reacted to that hurt in the best way we know how to do. And maybe it's been harmful for others. That's the openness. That's the vulnerability that we're trying to cultivate there. You know. And we may have very difficult people in our lives. You may be the difficult person in people's lives. <laughs> you know. And we have to say, you know what? This person wasn't born a pain in the ass. But they had causes and conditions that impacted and influenced them to show up in the way that they're showing up. And those causes and conditions maybe were different than mine. Maybe I had what I needed to be loving, to be connected, to be grounded. And maybe other people didn't. You know, I'm not going to blame you for not having what you needed, but I'm certainly not, you know, going to enable you at the same time. You know, it sucks, but when you're out of control, you're out of control, and there has to be things that we do to decrease that impact of someone being out of control, including setting boundaries and so forth. And that's compassion. Silence. That's the next principle for me. So Rumi writes, Listen, clam up your mouth and be silent like an oyster shell, for that tongue of yours is the enemy of the soul, my friend. When the lips are silent, the heart has a hundred tongues. You know, and for those of you who have been practicing meditation for a bit, you realize the truth of that. You start sitting and getting that groundedness, and all of a sudden the mind starts talking. <laughs> You know, but it's more than just the mind talking. The more we sit, the more we practice, the more sensitive we get to all kinds of things that are happening around us, to energy, to different forms of presence that are around us. And so you begin to see that the silence is actually very full of things. The silence isn't about emptiness, but the silence carries a weight you know, that can be distracting as well. You know, but for me, silence is crucial because I need to have access to hearing all the stuff around me, to hearing really my inner experience. Um, sometimes I say I'm a child of silence. And this is where my dharma comes from, is from the silence. It's from the stillness. It's not from the noise, it's not from the chatter, it's from the inner stillness. That's what's really teaching me, and that's what I use to teach others. I always start the day in silence. You know, no matter what I have to do, I get up early enough so I can have at least at least an hour of silence. You know, hopefully more than that. And that silence can be practicing, that silence can just be sitting, but it's just like I need to be invited back into interaction, not just wake up and jump out of bed and just start doing stuff. You know, it's a kindness that I show myself. Sources of refuge is another principle. We need to rely on something. You know, we need to take refuge in something. So I have a quote from Escape. Um, so I'm from near Atlanta. I grew up outside of Atlanta, so of course I'm going to be an Escape fan. Um, you should too. <laughs> now everyone knows this song. Well, not everyone. I, this is a generalization. Um, but this is a, a song lyric for, from Escape. Who can I run to <laughs> to share this empty space? Who can I run to when I need love. <laughs> Who can I run to to fill this empty space with laughter? Who can I run to when I need love? <laughs> yeah, they sang that. Mm. Um, 
but this is the heart of this. Like, who do I go to? Like, what is it that I take refuge in? Because I can't do it by myself. You know, and this is, you know, in Buddhism, this is why the three gems, the three sources of refuge, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, are really, that's the, that's why we do that. That's why we take refuge, because we need to rely on other sources of support around us. You know, and I teach the seven homecomings, which some of you have practiced with me. And I expand on the three jewels, and I offer not just like the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, but also the earth and silence and ancestors and you know, um, our lineage, you know, we bring in, we call into the space what we need, and then we fall into that. We fall into being held by our sources of refuge. For some of us, you know, we may call it, you know, in other traditions, we have the term beloved. What, who is your beloved? What is your beloved? You know, is it God? You know, is it Allah? You know, um, is it, uh, Tara, is it Ganesh, you know, um, what is your sense of a, a, of a divine energy, a, a source that you can lean into? You can, all, you can also call it the, the wisdom of your mind, your, your natural Buddhahood, your innate Buddhahood. These are the things that we rely on. You know, when I am struggling with things, I, in my practice, I have the mother, the divine feminine. The sacred feminine. So when I struggle, I call on the mother. You know, which is Tara, which is Durga, um, which is Mother Mary. You know, like I say, Mother, please help me. You know, and for me, that creates a openness and a spaciousness that helps me to move through the things I'm struggling with in the moment. You know. It helps me to accept what's happening around me. Um, so the next principle is befriending the woundedness. And this is a, uh, uh, a quote and a part of a poem from Essex Hemphill, um, who is a black uh, gay poet um, who died in the 80s or early 90s. Um, from AIDS-related complications. Speaking of uh, elders who have, you know, been taken by the epidemic. But in this poem he writes, I am dying twice as fast as any other American, between 18 and 35. This disturbs me, but I try not to show it in public. Um, so we talked about a lot of this last night, but how do we do the work of mourning the sadness, mourning our disappointments, mourning the realization that we won't be able to see what we need to see happen in the world. You know, how do we mourn the reality, you know, and the realization that the world is, is moving in a direction that's really scary? You know, so when I say mourning, you know, I mean that we touch into the sadness, we allow that sadness to move through our experience, and we see it as an experience, experience, not inherently who we are. I am not sad. I am not angry. I am experiencing anger. I am experiencing sadness. This isn't who I am, you know, and that helps the, the experience move through, you know. There's n there's nothing there's no there's no there's nowhere to go when you are something. You know where's the space where's the room to do something different? You know I am I'm angry. So you basically just told yourself you're inherently anger. You know instead of seeing anger as this experience, like a number of experiences that are happening in the same moment. So, so when I befriend my woundedness, I see it as something that is teaching me. You know, I see it as a friend. You know, because it's actually trying to show me something really important about who I am. And so we waste 
we waste the pain. We waste the, the woundedness. We waste that all the time. We just we we want to get rid of it. We want to push it to the side. Instead, we have to do the practice of inviting that woundedness to have a seat at the table. You know, because the path of liberation through the woundedness is actually through the woundedness, not around it, not over it, not under it's not the bear hunt. Right, you know. And I actually got a children's story right this time. <laughs> so I struggle through these children's stories. I like to use children's stories as example, you know, to talk about things, but the bear hunt. I can't go over I can't go around it. This is the same attitude we bring to difficult things in our experience. It's not about going over it, under it, around it. It's not about erasing it. It's about going through it. And as we move into a relationship with that pain, we begin to see that it's not what we thought it was. You know, We think that the pain is just this one solid experience, but it's actually uh, a, 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 all these different experiences woven together, that through our practice, through our awareness practice, we begin to unthread bit by bit, you know. So the pain is in the mountain, it's actually just a wad of thread, you know. But we'll never know that if we keep avoiding it. So the beloved community, um, Again, the collective. And Bell Hooks writes, Beloved community is formed not by the eradication of difference, but by its affirmation, by each of us claiming the identities and cultural legacies that shape who we are and how we live in the world. You know, it's, embracing who, it's embracing everything about who and what we are, and that becomes that strength, but it's also about the loyalty, the devotion that we have to one another as we do the work of liberation. So there's no, well, I would say the path for me is about collective liberation. As I do the work that I need to do to get free, but also come back and support the community and having collective liberation, you know, which is super hard to do. As my teacher said that like things would be easier if it wasn't for other people. You know, you can get free. You can just do the practices and get free and get out of here. You know, um, and that's really, that's a path, that's a legitimate path. And that's not, you know, I'm not going to like talk shit about that path because, you know, sometimes you need to get the hell out of here, <laughs> you know. Um, but for me, it is the path of making sure as many people around me can get free as I'm doing the work of getting free. Um, This is where, you know, American Dharma has to move into, into collective liberation, into collective work, not just individual. I'm not going to come in, sit on my little cushion and just do my meditation practice and sashay out. You know, it's about coming to the space, sitting down and saying, I wonder how everyone else is getting free. <laughs> you know, I wonder if indeed my liberation is bound up in other people's liberation. That's going to change the nature of your practice. Um, so I just want to move through some of this a little quicker because I want to get to discussion. But um, the, the next principle, the power of no. So the power of boundaries. And I have this quote from Emma Goodman. This is literally my favorite quote by Emma Goodman. If I can't dance, I don't want to be a part of your revolution. You know, so if I can't drop a like it's hot, don't invite me to your party. <laughs> right? If I can't show up like being all of this, then you don't want me. You know, so that's the thing. It's like my self care is about how am I being invited to enter into spaces? You know, am I am being invited to show up as my whole self or as a piece of me being invited and the other pieces being told to be left at the door? And that's also, then it goes also into boundaries. It's like, okay, then how can I just say no? Like, no, this isn't good enough. No, this isn't right for me. This isn't healthy for me. You know, the power of no particularly, you know, it's like we need to s understand that no is a whole sentence. It's a complete sentence, you know. And 
things may need to get done. You know, there are things, that, you know, that are there that need to get done, but like maybe I just don't have the resources to do it. And if I go over that edge, and then I will be afraid of what that impact will be on me. You know, sometimes we have to leave certain work undone. And you say, you know what, I can't do anything about it. Because I'm about surviving and sustaining myself for the long term. Not just for this one moment. Speaking is the next principle. Speaking, articulating, communicating. This is Zora Neale Hurston's quote. If you are silent about your pain, they'll kill you and say you enjoyed it. Again, a really important quote for me. Um, like how do we begin to articulate our realities, our experiences, you know, like some of us struggle, some of us go through all this stuff, but we will never say a word about it, you know, there are, you know, people, there have been people in my life who have just been sick and struggling, really pushing themselves, and all of a sudden they die, you know, and you're like, what happened? And it turns out that they were sick. They were, you know, they were stressed. They Something had impacted them really severely and they didn't communicate. You know, how do we do the work of communicating what we're experiencing to our communities, to ourselves? You know, how do we essentially ask ourselves, what do I need? How do we ask our communities to provide what we need? You know, that's crucial. How do I ask people to help me? I can't do this. How can I ask? How can I speak what I need? Crying. That's the next principle. And this is my quotes. Cry. Dry your tears. Then continue. Repeat if necessary. I just want to, like again, center the work of grieving again and the, to allow the body to respond to that grieving in the way that it needs to respond. Because some of us are like, oh, I don't cry. You know, I'm a man. Men don't cry. You know, and one of my subversive acts started, you know, has recently been, well, over the past two two or three years or so, has been to, to cry publicly you know, to grieve publicly, to mourn publicly, you know, and sometimes I do this community grieving um, practice workshop with groups, and it's really about pooling our collective grief together and then working through that energy as a group together, you know, and allowing each other to fall into being held by one another in that grieving. So I have like one kind of thing to read, but I'll save this to the very end. So it's just like a thing that I've created. Some of you have probably seen it before or read it. Um, but I want to open just, you know, the next 15 minutes or so for just for like questions or anything.